Good morning, everyone. Um, as we just heard this morning, we are headed back together in the, into the book of Romans. So if you have a Bible with you, now is a great time for it. Why don't you turn to the book of Romans with me? Earlier this year, starting just after Easter time and working through to just at the start of summer, we spent time together on Sunday mornings looking at the first 11 chapters of Romans. Romans is a letter written by a man called Paul, written to the church in Rome. And I wonder, do you ever watch those series on Netflix where they don't necessarily release all of the series in one go? So you might watch series one and like you're gripped and you're hooked by it and you want to watch it all, but then you have to wait. You have to wait until series two comes out. And then again, at the end of that one, you're like, what's going to happen in the final series? And you have to wait again until it comes out. Well, if you're anything like me, by the time you get to that final series, you need that little previously on dot, 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 just to remember what on earth happened in the first couple of series. So I guess maybe you've joined us in the last couple of months. You are so welcome if that's the case. Or maybe like me, you can just sometimes be a little bit forgetful. For the benefit of us, here's a little, like a lightning quick previously on Romans if you weren't here at the start of the year. The first 11 chapters of Romans are primarily about our relationship with God. They're about our vertical relationship with him, how God loves us, how he seeks us, how he sent Jesus to save us, how he forgives us, he pursues us, he adores us, he never leaves us or forsakes us. It's actually about how none of us, on account of the sin, the wrong stuff in our lives, are able to come before a holy and perfect God because of the sin in our lives. And not only that, it said earlier in Romans that it's, we are actually born into sin. We're born into the sin represented in the first man, Adam. I don't know if you remember Chris Allison's pink buckets that he had on the stage. We are born into the mess of Adam's sin. And that's who we are. But the good news, God, because of his love for us, because of his mercy, sent Jesus to die for us so that we no longer find ourselves, that we know Jesus, we're no longer in the bin of Adam, but we're found in Christ, in him. And actually now, as followers of Jesus, we know freedom. We're no longer slaves to the sin, the wrong stuff in our lives, but we find ourselves as slaves to righteousness. We have the Holy Spirit living in us, empowering us now to live as more than conquerors. It was all about our vertical relationship with God, what he has done for us. Amazing, rich truth. And today we're headed into the second half of our series in Romans. And it's under this heading, Living the Gospel. So from chapter 12 through to 16, the remainder of this book, Paul talks about our horizontal relationships now with one another. And the point is simply this. Once you have your vertical relationship with God, you have an example for all of your horizontal relationships. For example, God loves us, so we love one another. God forgave us, so we forgive one another. God God was so generous to us, So we show generosity towards one another. The big idea is simply this. The way that God treats us is the way that we get to treat one another and set culture as God's people, as his people here at King's Community Church. And this morning, I have the real privilege of talking from Romans chapter 12. So where does Paul start when he starts talking about, okay, how do you live out the gospel, the good news of Jesus? We're going to look this morning at the topic of worship. And once we've, uh, what I want to do this morning is start by unpacking the question, well, what does it truly mean to worship? What does it really mean to worship God? And then once we've done that, I want us to look at three ways that Paul tells us how we can worship. So should we open the Bible together? Let's read God's word. Let's read from Romans chapter 12. You can follow along on the screen behind me. It says this, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behaviour and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Because of the privilege and the authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think yourselves to be better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourself by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. 
in his grace, God has given us different gifts, gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. Giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. I wonder what you would think of if I asked you right now to think back to the most significant, profound, poignant worship moment or worship experience that you've ever had. Just think for a moment. Think back. Is there something that stands out for you? Because actually, whatever our background, wherever we've come from this morning, as human beings, we are hardwired to worship something or worship someone. Simply to, to worship something means to ascribe worth to it, to deem it as worthy, to devote yourself to it, to praise it. What does it truly mean to you to worship something? And what is, what is true worship for Paul? Because we read, didn't we, just one of those verses that said, this is truly the way to worship him. Well, from the verses we just read, here are two things that Paul says worship is. And then let me suggest maybe two things where in our culture, in our way of doing church, sometimes we can misinterpret what worship is. So two things that worship is and two things that it isn't. What does Paul say? Firstly, true worship is a response. True worship is a response. Give your bodies to God. Why? Because of all that he has done for you. In view of all that God has done for us, Worship is our response to him. Do you notice something really important there? We don't start worship. It doesn't start with us. We don't initiate it. It's in light of everything that God has already done for us. Side note, let me talk for a moment about worship songs. It's hugely important for us that when we gather together as God's people and spend time in worship, that we start in the place where we recall, remember, declare together who God is and what he has already done for us. That's our starting point. Andy mentioned a few weeks ago that actually we learn a great deal of our theology, what we know about God and who he is. We learn a lot of that from the songs that we sing. There's something about melody and rhythm that just helps things stick in our minds. Sunday afternoon, often you'll find yourself, if you're anything like me, singing the songs because they're stuck in your head from the morning. And we learn a lot of our theology about God from those songs. This was made really real to me over the summer when at a conference, a a preacher said to a congregation, okay, everyone, fill in the blank. And he said, Jesus said, I will build my dot, dot, dot. And a very small portion of the room said, Jesus said, fill in the blank, I will build my church. But actually a far larger group of people said, okay, fill in the blank. Jesus said, I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. And that's a great song that we sing together. I love it. But that's not actually what Jesus said. Our worship songs teach us a lot of what we know about God. And the songs that we sing, they fit into two categories of songs, revelation songs and response songs. Let me give you an example. In Christ Alone, I don't know if you know that song, an amazing song. It's four verses, eight lines per verse, 32 lines of objective revelation truth about who God is the truth of the gospel, the good news of Jesus, who we are in him. What an amazing song. At the end of it, you, like, you just feel richly fed with the truth of God. Another song, another slightly older song, you might remember it, This Is My Desire. It's actually a response song. This is my desire. Lord, I give you my heart, my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath I take, every moment I'm awake, have your way in me. It's actually nothing in that song about God. Nothing about who he is. Both of those songs, amazing songs, so powerful, but let's be wise in how we use them and let's sing them at the right moment. Worship is our response to who God is. So I love this morning being fed of the truth of who God is. He's awesome, he's holy. What's our response to that? Jesus, we love you. We love you. Second thing, what does Paul say true worship is? True worship is sacrificial. He said, let our lives be a living and holy sacrifice. So in the Old Testament, before Jesus, God's people worshipped him in a very different way than we do now. So to account for their sin, they were just normal human human beings, they messed up. And to account for the wrong things that they'd done, the people needed a sacrifice in order for a holy God to be made approachable. 
So with the sin in their lives, they couldn't just rock up together and start singing together on a Sunday, worship a perfect, holy God. No, sin and God's presence, God's holiness, weren't compatible. They couldn't coexist together. And so these atoning sacrifices that the people had to provide were the means by which God would deal with the sin of the people and would provide a way to maintain a right relationship between God and human beings in order that God's presence could be with God's people. You fast forward, and on the cross, Jesus offered himself to God in our place, bearing our sin and its deserved judgment as our sacrifice, and thus satisfying God's just demands against us. He frees us from our sin, and he reconciles us to God. All that the Old Testament sacrifices symbolize, Jesus actually accomplished in his saving work. The Old Testament sacrifices were symbolic and anticipatory, pointing forwards towards Jesus' offering of himself on our behalf. So Paul here, when he's talking about what what does it truly mean to worship God, he's using this language and this imagery of sacrifice to show us that to truly worship is to bring our whole selves before God as an offering to him. Not an offering to die, but a living and holy sacrifice all because of the once and for all atoning offering of Jesus on the cross. Worship is sacrificial. It's about coming to God and dying to ourselves and offering ourselves to him. For some of you this morning, you will have encountered that as we were worshipping. Actually, it's about coming before God and recognising, oh God, you're Lord of my life, not me. And I want to offer myself to you again. For some of us, worship is a very physical sacrifice. It's sacrificial on a physical part. Maybe you're newer amongst us here, and actually for you to engage in worship and observe the people around you and to lift your hands is is sacrificial. What on earth are people going to think about me? It's a sacrifice of praise. True worship for Paul is a sacrificial response to God for all he's done for us. And as I said, I think it's also important that we recognise for a moment where we in our culture and our way of doing church, perhaps, where can we maybe slightly misinterpret and misunderstand what true worship is? Here are a few suggestions. Worship is not a genre of music. Worship is not a genre of music. Do you notice Paul hasn't said anything in these verses about singing? He said nothing about bands or music. I wonder how many of us might have finished singing a few moments ago, taken our seats and thought to ourselves, that was a good time of worship, wasn't it? Didn't they lead us well in worship today? Or that's the worship over for today. Or I wonder a moment ago when I asked you to think of a significant, profound worship memory, how many of us will have automatically jumped to think about a time when there was music and singing? Paul doesn't mention music at all. Now, I realise I'm in ever so slight danger here of somewhat talking myself out of a job. It's, it's my real privilege. I love spending my life serving and leading our team of musicians here at King's Community Church. What a privilege. What a delight. I loved being led in worship this morning. I loved last Sunday night. We had an encounter night where we huddled together in the middle of the room and we had an extended time of singing and making music before God. So good. But... That's not what Paul says true worship is. It's not about stages. It's not about bands. It's not about drummers in cages or Igor playing the pads over there. No, those things are all helpful and they're wonderful. What gifts they are to help us when we come together. But I wonder whether God this morning might want to slightly enlarge in our view of what it truly means to worship him, to live a whole life of worship, not just 30 minutes on a Sunday. The second myth that I think we can, the way that we can misunderstand worship is that worship is something that just happens in church, or worship is something that starts and stops. You are constantly worshipping. You were worshipping before you came here today. You'll be worshipping when you leave. You'll be worshipping tomorrow when you get up and you get ready to go to the office or do the school run or go to college or university. We are always constantly worshipping. We're always living for someone or something, and the decisions we make for The thoughts that we entertain, the pounds that we invest, they're all worship decisions. They're all connected to our heart and they're decisions that are based on who or what has that position of priority in our lives. So what is true worship for Paul? True worship is our sacrificial response to what God has done for us and who he is. 
So how do we worship? I just want to spend the rest of the time this morning drawing out three principles that Paul gives us of how we worship. And they are these. We worship in head, heart, and hands. Firstly, worship with your head. Let's read again, Romans 12, 2. So don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. How does Paul tell us that we can truly worship? It's by changing the way that you think. Some translations say it's by renewing your mind. In other words, this is something that happens in your head. Do you know, we live under a weight of pressure to conform. Let me give you a slightly silly example. So as I said, as I said earlier, it's a joy and delight that I get to, to work here at King's Community Church, but I'm afraid to say it will never actually be my favorite ever job that I've had. So I... Um, a few years ago, was employed, believe it or not, by the mighty Liverpool Football Club. Um, unfortunately, I didn't play very much. I didn't play at all. I wasn't a, a, tran- a transfer deal. But I actually had the noble role of I was a turnstile operator. So I would let people into the home ground on match days. Um, and t- I'll tell you what, I've never experienced the pressure or the weight to conform as I did when I was letting people into the home ground at Liverpool Football Club. So what would happen is that quite large, beefy, scouse men would come through the turnstile and they would say something to you and they would talk to you. And I would reply in my very high-pitched, softy southerner accent and instantly they would look at me like, what on earth are you doing here? And they would say something probably less polite than this. They would say something like, get off back down to London or something. I've never lived in London, but it's all the south to them. So they, they, I've never felt the weight of pressure to conform as though I stuck out as I did then. So by the second game that I did, I just used to pretend. I'd put on a fake Scouse accent myself. They'd say something to me, I'd reply, and I would just conform and be like them, mainly out of fearing for my physical safety. Our culture, the world around us, bears down on us with a weight to conform. It's true for all of us. It's true for our children in schools, massively, through to colleges, university, the workplaces we're in, the local communities we're a part of, our world is piling pressure on us to conform, not to be different, don't stick out. And because of the sin in the world, these pressures are pressures to conform into patterns of often sinful brokenness. They can be easy to fall into, difficult to transform. They can often be mindless. Subconsciously, we can find ourselves just adapting to the world around us and conforming. However, Paul said, don't be conformed. How? How do you avoid it? How do you not conform? By using your head. God can change the way that you think. When pressure bears down on you, you can choose to focus your mind on Jesus. You can choose to focus your mind on his, on his mercy, on his, his very nature, his goodness, his love for us. You can choose to focus on your identity being in Christ. And reject the lie that our identity is wrapped up in the world around us. And that's who we are. We can choose to reject patterns or routines of behavior that the world promotes as desirable. And we can choose to live with a heart that's right before God. Changing your mind to focus on Jesus changes your life. When we understand God's love and his mercy, we find the reason to transform our lives and renew our minds. And we find ourselves suddenly wanting to spend time in prayer talking to God. We find ourselves wanting to spend time reading God's word, uh, spending time listening to God. What is it you're saying to me? In other words, we can fill our minds with him. We can focus on God rather than ourselves. We worship with our head. Secondly, we worship with our heart. Verse three said, don't think that you are better than you really are. Don't think that you're better than you really are. True worship is a posture of the heart before God. Let me share with you a little bit of my story. So when I was a teenager, let me tell you, worship music and worship leading and playing the guitar and singing just looked like the coolest thing in the world. And I thought, how do I get to do that? How can I do that? How can I get up there on that? stage? How, how can I be seen to be doing that? Wouldn't I be so popular? Wouldn't I just look so cool if I did that? And you know, maybe if I, if, I, if I play the guitar and I sing in youth group and I do that really, really well and I show everyone just how great I am, maybe then I'll be allowed to do a Sunday morning. Can you imagine that? 
And maybe then, like, if I do that really well for a long time, maybe I'll get to go and lead worship at, at New Day. What, just what a joke that would be. How cool would I look? And there was so much pride in all of the motives behind that. That was all wrapped up. But that under the surface, I thought I was so much better than I was. Thankfully, God put wise and godly people around me to give me advice and to challenge me. But I remember one day, God really nailed me on this. And actually, it was a moment when I was leading worship as a, as a young worship leader. And anyone in the worship team here will know that I'm actually very bad at lyrics and remembering song words, which is actually really annoying. Uh, I've got like a sieve of a memory and I mess up the words all the time. And once I, I was leading a song, it's a slightly old song now, it's called Living for Your Glory, and messed up the words and accidentally sung the line, Jesus, I'm living for my glory. And I felt Usually that would be like you'd laugh it off. I felt sick in the pit of my stomach as I felt God challenge me in a moment and say to me, oh, do you know that is truer than you even realise? Living for your own glory. How do we truly worship God? Our heart posture is to be humble before him. Everything that we have is a gift from him. He gave it to us in the first place. He could take it away in a moment. Don't think yourself to be better than you really are. Listen, this isn't just true for for worship musicians, worship leaders, those who do something up the front. No, this is, are we all sacrificially bringing ourselves to God in worship every day and saying, God, you're Lord of everything, not me. Don't think yourself to be better than you really are. Where in your life might you need to come before God in worship and just repent? God, I know I can put too much significance on myself. Where do I need to reposition my heart before him? Finally, so we worship with our head, we worship in our heart posture. Finally, we worship with our hands. Worship with your hands. Let's read together again from verse four. Paul said, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, individually members of one another. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. What gift has God given you? So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. Encouragement, be encouraging. Giving, give generously. If he's given you leadership ability, take it seriously. Showing kindness, do it gladly. How do we truly worship God? Worship with your hands. Worship involves us doing something. We aren't passive To worship is a verb, it's an action that requires something, which is this, to play our part. What are you carrying in your hands that God has given you? Paul uses this illustration of of the church, God's people being a body in a couple of places, and he does it to show the beautiful diversity that we are all different parts, but also to show the, the unity, the connection, the interdependence that we have on one another. I played football yesterday, and it's no surprise to me today that my legs are really aching today. And because my legs are aching, it's not like my legs are hurting, but up here I'm like, well, I'm fit as a fiddle, I'm fine up here. No, if one part of the body hurts, it affects the whole thing. Like with us, if one, one part suffers, the whole does. And the point of that is to show that each of us, every single one of us, has a part to play, something to bring. We each have something that God has placed in our hands as our part to play. Worship is not spectator sport. Worship is our whole lives of obedience to God, but particularly now talking about when we do come together to worship God together, worship is not entertainment. It's not something that you sit back and watch and enjoy. It's not something that you spectate. It's something that you participate in. So what has God put in your hands to bring to the table. The list that Paul gives us in these verses, it's not exhaustive, but it's all stuff that we can engage in this morning. Prophecy, serving, teaching, encouragement, kindness, generosity, leading. Do you know, worship didn't start this morning with the first song when they started playing House of the Lord. Do you know, worship for you this morning may have started when you drove into the car park and somebody on our amazing car park team showed you where to go with their beautiful act of worship. Joe, when you came into the building and there was some welcome team showing you some hospitality, that was their act of worship. What has God put in your hands for you to play your part? Who is God prompting you to encourage this morning? Where is he calling you to be generous? 
Where might he be calling you to serve? Let's be a people who worship in head, yes, in heart, yes, but also let's see that translate into action, into using the gifts that God has given us. We're actually going to take communion together in a moment to respond. And this is for those of us who are followers of Jesus. And when we take communion, this meal of bread and wine, it actually represents a lot of things for us. So in 1 Corinthians, Paul explains the, the multifaceted nature of this, of this moment that we're going to have. Communion is about dwelling on the cross where Jesus died for us. It's about celebrating together the resurrection of Jesus. It's about declaring that Jesus will come again. It's about bringing unity as we do it together as God's people. But here's another thing that Paul says it's about. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. You should examine yourselves before eating the bread and drinking the cup. This moment of communion today is a moment of self-examination for us to come before God in worship and examine ourselves and maybe take seriously these questions. Where might I have misunderstood what it truly means to worship God? To live a whole life of worship. Where might I have fallen into just pigeonholing worship to mean it's about half an hour of singing on a Sunday? Where have I allowed the world around me to shape my behavior and how I think? Have I conformed to the pressures of the world around me? Do I have a a heart posture of humility before God? Do I need to take seriously Paul's challenge not to think more of myself than I should? Or what is it that God is calling you to do in obedience to him as your act of worship? What does he put in your hands to carry? Let's come to him in worship and take communion together. Can we stand together? We're actually not going to rush into singing together. We're going to come to God in worship. We're going to come to God in head, heart, and body. We're going to come to God in self-examination before we come to him and sing together. The team will lead us in a song in a moment. But just as the music's playing, I'm going to pray. And I'd love to just invite us to come to the tables in self-examination. Take seriously these questions that are going to stay up on the screen. God, where do I need to get right before you today? God, we thank you for the privilege it is to live lives of worship to you. Thank you that it's all because of who you are and what you've already done. It doesn't start with us. Thank you for who you are. And we want to take this moment really seriously now where we examine ourselves before you and allow you to speak to us, to shape us, to encourage us, to strengthen us, to convict us where needed. And God, we want this to be a moment where we reposition ourselves on our knees before you in light of who you are. Amen. Why don't we start moving now? Let's come to the table. Let's take bread and juice together. Then in a moment, the team are going to lead us in a song. Let's come now.